Media. I'm Albert Liu. Today is Monday, March 9th. Uh, drastic moves in the market uh, this morning and on the call uh, to help make sense of this is Rick Rule, President and CEO of Sprott U.S. Holdings. Uh, Rick, how are you? I'm fine, Albert. Uh, I must say, <laughs> like the Chinese curse, we live in interesting times. Yes. Um, but the truth is, you play the cards that are dealt you. This will be an interesting conversation, fit for an interesting market. Right. Uh, let me set the stage for the viewers because a lot's happened since you and I last talked. So let me set the stage and then I'll get your thoughts on what's going on. So last week on uh, what was already a very challenging week for the markets, we had the OPEC plus group, that is OPEC plus non-OPEC large producers meet in Vienna uh, to try to negotiate what was going to be a one and a half million barrel per day production cut uh, to try to cope with the supply surplus we have as a result of coronavirus. Uh, apparently that didn't go well. Russia was kind of caught off guard. They didn't agree. They all walked away. And so not only did we not get the one and a half million cut, but apparently that the existing arrangement they have in place is set to expire. And we have nothing on that. That sent oil markets uh, into a downward spiral overnight, Rick. I saw last night before I went to sleep, $27 a barrel. It's up from there. But that's sort of caused a chain reaction that has sent markets in a, in a tailspin. Uh, Japan uh, closed down 5%. Uh, Europe is down 5 to 7%. Uh, futures for U.S. equities actually stopped trading. They halted uh, on the downward limit uh, overnight. It resumed this morning when uh, trading opened in New York, but that uh, soon closed again as they hit the 7% uh, downward limit on the S&P. So they paused, they reopened. Uh, we're now 6% down uh, as I speak here, Rick. So that's in a nutshell what happened overnight. Uh, this is the lowest oil prices have been since the Gulf War, apparently, or the, the biggest, uh, biggest hit they've taken since the Gulf War. And this has a chain reaction potentially, and, and that's what we discussed last week. If that was a problem last week, it's definitely going to be a problem this week. So let's pick it up from here, Rick. What do you see? Well, you packed a lot of questions <laughs> into a week, a, week of, a week of events. So let's try and make some sense of some of it. Um, your recitation uh, of events, I think, is accurate. Uh, OPEC uh, and the Russians uh, attempted to meet to cut oil production enough to stabilize the price. The price, as we have discussed several times, has declined because it would appear that the impact of the coronavirus worldwide, but particularly in China, has reduced oil demand by about two and a half million barrels a day. Resource investors know that prices are set on the margin. They're net, not set across 95 to 100 million barrels a day of supply or demand, but rather where supply and demand meet. And a reduction in demand by two and a half million barrels a day, that is by sort of 3% of supply, was enough by itself to kick the oil price down 25 or so percent. The uh, news with regards to the showdown between the Russians and the Saudis uh, did two things in the very near term. It uh, eliminated probably the possibility of any coordinated supply cuts, but the Saudis also decided to use, or at least have announced that they're going to use their ultimate weapon, which is to increase their production at the same time that they reduce the quote for Saudi crude in the European market, uh, a strategy designed specifically to hurt Russian export crudes into Europe. Now, my suspicion is that the other than psychological economic impact of this is actually beneficial. Uh, a big decline in oil prices, unless you happen to be like myself, an oil stock investor, is all positive. It acts like a tax cut. That is, the bills to industry and to consumers for petroleum products decline 
which is a very good thing. Uh, not necessarily so good if you're an oil stock owner. I'll get to that later. Uh, but the actual economic impact of an oil price cut is probably a good thing. The problems, I think, come in a couple of shapes. But one problem has to do uh, with the impact of loyal, low oil prices on the wealth uh, of pension funds and people who invest in oil equities. And the other is on the impact on banks uh, that have lent large amounts of money to oil companies based on a $60 price deck. Remember that if the price of oil goes from $60 to $40, it all comes out of operating margin. In fact, at $40, many, many, many companies are uh, negative. That is, generate negative free cash flow rather than positive free cash flow across the whole oil price deck. And the impact both on oil producers, particularly leveraged oil producers, and also on the banks that lend to them, if these prices continue, will be, not could be, will be severe. Uh, and when I say the banks, I'm talking about major U.S. banks, oil center banks, Canadian banks, and also European banks that lend to the European oil and gas industry. Uh, another impact that could be felt in the short and intermediate term uh, will be or could be at least on the non-investment grade or junk bond markets. In particular, the junk bond ETFs. Uh, I read today, I don't know if it's true, but I read today that 16% of U.S. publicly traded sub-investment grade credits, junk credits, were issued to the oil and gas business. The problem becomes that the largest investors in these junk bonds are income ETFs, junk bond ETFs. And the problem here is that if you begin to see large-scale retail redemptions of the ETFs, the ETF managers will need to sell bonds that may be highly illiquid themselves. When you have a liquid top structure, an ETF, owning a whole bunch of illiquid assets, the need by the managers to sell illiquid assets to fund redemptions could, I'm not saying it will, but could provoke real panic in the junk bond markets. And that panic could, I'm not saying it will, spread over into other speculative asset classes, including equities. That's one nervousness that we have in the near term. I hope I packed uh, as many answers into that as you had packed questions. <laughs> I, they weren't questions, Rick, but they were options, and you addressed quite a few of them. Thank you for that. Um, Thank you. Let, let's stick with the with this uh, junk bond theme for a second, Rick. Would you expect to see trading in these ETFs, particular in individual ETFs, halted if that if that happened? How does that work? I don't know. Um, I really don't know what happens. It may be that there are provisions in place where provisions could be put in place to gate these ETFs, uh, that is to constrain investors' ability to exit them. Um, and I don't know what psychological impact that would have on markets, uh, uh, other types of ETFs where investors believe that they had a highly liquid option uh, to buy and sell classes of securities. And remember, all of this that I'm saying now is highly speculative. Uh, I, I just look at what I suspect could be the outcome from current events one or two or three months hence. And that's one of the things that I see as being possible on the horizon. Yeah. Rick, one of the things I've been wondering since last week, since the, the news broke on Friday of this, of the disagreement and the failure to reach a, uh, an agreement with OPEC and Russia was who is the instigator and who is the targeted victim and who, who is collateral damage here? Is it, is it Russia inflicting pain on Saudis? Is, is it Saudi inflicting pain on Russia? Or are they looking at U.S. shale and saying this is going to be very disruptive to sort of the shale and financial markets? Any thoughts on that? Do you wish to speculate on that at all? 
Uh, you know, it's a little above my pay grade, Albert. Uh, I would suggest that the companies have different interests, and each comp- each country was pursuing its own interest. The Saudis have traditionally been seen, if there is such a thing, as a leader within OPEC. And the Saudis were attempting to enforce pricing discipline and price stability. That is to say, a price ceiling. Uh, the Russians were interested in having the Saudis establish a price ceiling so that they could ex- <laughs> undercut it <laughs> and <laughs> export oil into Europe. And I guess uh, at least the, t- the popular explanation is that the Saudis uh, got sick of providing protection for Russia to take market share from them in critical European markets. Um, this is the popular explanation, and I don't see any reason to doubt it. The collateral damage is certainly the U.S. shale industry. Uh, The U.S. shale industry has a high degree of capital intensity um, and has been very, very, very reliant on a low cost of capital. The problem is that this lower uh, oil price uh, environment takes the margin uh, out of the shale production and makes this highly geared capital structure uh, look extremely wobbly. Uh, It's both the Russians and the Saudis, I think, would suggest that the most destabilizing player in terms of world oil supply has been the United States uh, as a consequence of the shale production. And one impact of $35 or $40 crude will certainly be to stop most of the uh, capital programs in the shale industry in their tracks. Um, Another interesting thing to look at in the oil industry, uh, Albert, and I don't know how this plays, but both the Saudis and the Russians have announced 100 to 150 billion dollar capital expenditures in their own domestic oil and gas industry. I don't think either of these projects are economic at $40 oil. So we have a very interesting circumstance where the squabble between these two parties has probably impacted their own capital spending uh, schemes and has acted uh, as one might suspect it would to actually limit supplies in the future. Remember our very common, if unpleasant, theme, Albert, that the cure for low prices is low prices. Uh, At $35 or $40 oil, the first thing that companies do is that they reduce their sustaining capital expenditure, which over a year or a year and a half leads to production declines. But beyond limiting their sustaining capital investments, they also postpone, defer, or sometimes cancel the very heavy capital expenditures in long-lived projects. Uh, Among long-lived projects, one could lump in most of the capital-intensive shale projects that are taking place right now but could also uh, lump in Exxon's plan in Guyana, about 5 billion barrels recoverable. Uh, And one could certainly lump into that in terms of long-term capital spending programs, the $150 billion that Russia proposes to spend uh, in Arctic Siberia and the $100 billion program that the Saudis had, had planned to spend in their own Uh, shale capital expenditure programs. So what happens ironically is that the current pain that the oil industry and oil stock investors, and it will be severe, experience in a $35 to $40 pricing environment almost certainly leads to higher and perhaps dramatically higher oil prices four to five years from now as the capital spending deferrals that take place now reduce production, which they certainly will in the intermediate and longer term future. So this is one scenario where the, these prices persist and uh, the various players have to react accordingly. Uh, what if this is just uh, a little game that they're playing right now 
and uh, when the pressure mounts, they they are motivated to come to an agreement, and we see one to two million barrels a day go off the market. Uh, prices return to I don't know forty fifty dollar range. I'm wondering if that happens, how would you prepare for that scenario? We talked about a company like Exxon uh, last week, which you were interested in but didn't like at you know fifty dollars uh, price. What if that price is as it is now in the low 40s or if it dips below 40 into the 30s? Do you like it then? Uh, I think you probably do like Exxon uh, longer term. But I think in a market where panic is the norm, which is certainly where we are now, the way that you acquire the higher quality names is probably by selling puts. Uh, you probably take advantage of the panic in the market and certainly the volatility in the options markets to sell 90 to 120 day out of the market puts on high quality names by Exxon. Either you grab the put premium and walk away with the money uh, or else you are put a very high quality stock. I wouldn't play this game uh, if you didn't want to own Exxon for the longer term, by the way I do. Uh, and if you weren't prepared to see the price fall substantially below the so-called bargain price that you acquired it for as a consequence of selling the puts. Um, you can be right in the three to four year time frame and be terribly wrong in the six to 12 month time frame. While you are wrong in the six to 12 month time frame, you feel like an absolute moron for jumping in early. Although uh, oftentimes your feelings improve substantially in the three to five year time frame buying a high quality company like Exxon. This is not, by the way, not investment advice. Uh, Rick, let's switch gears now and let's talk about uh, precious metals and uh, safe havens. So you, the 10 year US Treasury fell through the half percent mark. Gold held up well, was up and then retraced a little bit. Uh, I'm wondering when you look at, for example, companies in the GDX, uh, GDX is down uh, today. A lot of those components are down, uh, if not all of them. I'm wondering how have they been fundamentally affected by what we've seen over the last couple of days? Well, we have to look a little further back to answer that question, Albert. Gold stocks are stocks. Uh, and when you have a panic sell off and when you have liquidity concerns, which you're certainly having in the market right now, what you realize is that all stocks sell off. Gold stocks sold off less than other types of stocks, but the truth is that gold stocks are stocks and the gold stocks sell off. Gold itself would be expected to do well as a consequence to the policy response to what we're seeing right now. The turbulence that you see in financial markets, major equity markets as an example, uh, if past is prologue, uh, will likely produce a policy response where our central bank and other central banks increase liquidity and depress already depressed interest rates on a global basis. That is to say, debasing various currencies, which would of course uh, ultimately be good for gold. When I say ultimately, the response might take three months or six months like it did in 2008, but the response likely uh, would be good for bullion and ultimately likely good for gold stocks. It's important to note in the midst of all the panic that we're experiencing, uh, Albert, that the current circumstance is extraordinarily good for gold. Uh, it doesn't mean that in the very near, very near term, the price will reflect the outlook. Remember Buffett famously saying, in the near term, markets are weighing, uh, voting machines, pardon me, they measure opinion and opinion is in panic. In the long term, markets are weighing machines rather than voting machines. And when you look at the arithmetic around gold's quote, weight, the arithmetic is very attractive. You mentioned the US 10 year treasury yielding about one half of 1%. Um, 
while I suspect that the cost of living will go down a little bit, not as a consequence of any political maneuvering, but rather as a consequence of markets reflecting lower energy prices, I still suspect that the real interest rate offered up by the U.S. 10-year Treasury is negative. To repeat once again that great Jim Grant quote, the 10-year Treasury offers up return-free risk. This is the U.S. government finally in a position to keep its promise. They promise to give you back less money than you gave them if you buy a U.S. 10-year Treasury. That's the competition that gold bullion faces. So I think the bullion does very well. How long before the equities reflect the relative and then absolute strength of the bullion? I don't know, but I suspect for speculators, the risk of being out of the stocks is higher than the risk being in the stocks, which isn't to say that they'll turn around in the near term. That's not the way markets work. I know the listeners to this uh, want a simple declarative statement. They want me to say that, you know, next Friday, this will happen, this will happen, and this will happen. <laughs> the truth is I have no idea in the near term what will happen. Life isn't about certainties. It's about a range of probabilities. And it's important to remember that when there's panic all about you as there is today. Yeah, Rick. So just to, uh, to punctuate that. Uh, companies like Wheaton, companies like Franco that are taking a hit right now, uh, you're saying that has more to do with liquidity and panic than any fundamental uh, information that's come out over the last 24, 48 hours. Is that correct? Absolutely the case. Absolutely the case. These are very, very, very high quality companies. I'm not trying to say that they were cheap before. But they are certainly the lowest risk equity ways to play a recovery in gold prices and a consequent recovery in the gold mining industry. Uh, one thought, this is me speculating, Rick, now uh, about gold. Gold responded, but it's pretty much flat now, which is interesting because uh, the New York Fed announced that they were going to increase their repo, their overnight repo facility uh, to 150, uh, I think, and from 100 billion. And gold is not responding to that. And it seems like gold is not responding very much to the, let's call them monetary band-aids that the Fed is applying for liquidity issues. But what I think it'll resp respond very strongly to is when the fiscal stimulus comes and there's calls for hundreds of billions, if not uh, a trillion, one, one popular economist on CNBC called for a trillion dollar package. I certainly think that gold would respond very strongly to that. What are your thoughts? I agree with you uh, absolutely and in each of your statements. Remember that the policy responses that you're seeing now from the Fed will take a little while to kick in and investors will take a, a little while to recover from their panic before they invest in anything other than, tra uh, other than cash. Uh, so we could see a response in a month or two months or three months. The second part, which is the um, spending that is likely to be uh, a consequence of the circumstance that we see now, uh, would almost certainly destabilize an already unstable currency uh, and cause some people to go into gold. You'll remember um, – President Obama's foreign domestic, former domestic policy advisor, pardon me, uh, Rahm Emanuel, talking about the fact that governments can never let a good crisis go to waste. Uh, and, and this gives the governments a wonderful chance to experiment and seize further controls of all of the levers of the economy from deficit spending to uh, overnight liquidity issuances, to artificially lowering interest rates. There is uh, absolutely no amount of foolishness that the government wouldn't be able to entertain that wouldn't enjoy a high degree of popularity from the electorate. It's difficult to see a circumstance uh, that comes out of this that shouldn't be good for gold. The sole exception to that 
would be if somehow the mood of the investment community became so starkly pessimistic that confidence in the Fed put disappeared. If the Fed were to give a treasury auction and nobody came, that is, if the Fed was forced to buy the entire auction themselves and the Fed lost control of interest rate markets. By the way, I'm not saying that, saying that this is going to happen. But if that happened, if the market itself reasserted control uh, over interest rates, then I think what you would see is a real financial panic. And that financial panic would consume gold too. Uh, Jeffrey Gunlock was on CNBC last week and he said uh, that the dollar getting weaker is essentially an unstated policy at this point. Do you agree with him on that? Um, that's above my pay grade. I think irrespective of what they want to do, that uh, great big markets like currency markets sort of work. I don't think that we've had a strong dollar policy in the United States for several years, but I think that we have been outpaced in the race to the bottom by our competitors. I think the U.S. dollar strength, strength, pardon me, hasn't been due so much as the strength in U.S. society and the U.S. economy as it has been due to greater weakness in places like China and Japan and the European Union. In other words, I think that our strength has been relative strength. Uh, I think this has given uh, some room to U.S. policymakers to continue their stupidity, but one wonders how much room for stupidity there is left. All right. Uh, let's leave it there, Rick. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. I've been speaking with Rick Brule, President, CEO of Sprott U.S. Holdings. Thank you very much, Rick. A pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.